Again, for the opportunity to uh, speak with you about EPIC's work on artificial intelligence. For people who are not familiar with uh, my organization, we were established uh, 25 years ago uh, to focus on emerging uh, privacy and civil liberties issues. Uh, rather than write an annual report, we produce a word cloud so you can see uh, the topics that we're working on. Uh, of relevance to this group, of course, is uh, algorithmic transparency, but also social scoring, which I'll come to um, in a moment. Um, we have been uh, very interested in the AI policy field uh, for a number of years, but I will say partly in, inspired by an article that I read about Governor Dukakis a few years ago calling for an international convention on AI. Uh, we stepped up our efforts and we now consider this to be our priority issue. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about this uh, letter that was published earlier this year in the New York Times, setting out um, our concerns about where the US is on AI, but also recognizing some progress. Quickly, and by way of background, one of the first uh, campaigns we had launched was in support of algorithmic transparency, which we viewed as a cornerstone principle to hold uh, AI-based systems uh, accountable. As part of our campaign, we actually produced uh, screen cleaners, which are on the table over here. Our theory was that you could not fix the code if you could not see the code. Uh, that tends to work well in campaigning, as do nice uh, laptop stickers. Um, some people really like this phrase, Bayesian determinations are not justice. I didn't fully understand it, but I went with them, so those stickers are available as well. Uh, as we were pursuing our um, grassroots efforts in support of human rights protections for AI-based systems, we were simultaneously working with international organizations, including the OECD in Paris, to develop a policy framework for the OECD member nations. Uh, I've served as an expert on a number of OECD uh, frameworks going back more than 25 years. And the OECD had recognized just a few years ago that AI was going to be an increasingly important issue for national governments. Uh, we had a series of meetings with the 36 member countries. Um, they announced in uh, May of this year, a uh, set of framework uh, principles that are briefly outlined here. Uh, I'll pause on this slide for a moment so you can see that the first principle for the OECD countries is that AI should benefit uh, people and the planet. It's generally understood as the human-centric principle. Um, the OECD said AI systems should respect the rule of law, human rights, and democratic uh, values, uh, which is a principle that we had uh, pushed for and thought was uh, absolutely critical for democratic nations to support. We had transparency incorporated in the OECD framework. We talked about systems that were robust, secure, and safe and then also a sense of accountability for organizations and businesses that were deploying uh, AI-based systems. Um, as I said, this actually fits in a sequence of international frameworks that the OECD has set up, which have, in fact, been quite influential. It's an interesting organization. Uh, the OECD uh, principles are non-binding but they are as soft law as international norms, uh, very influential and oftentimes are adopted into national law or form the basis of international agreements. So almost immediately, one of our next tasks will be to assess the incorporation of the OECD AI principles into national law and we've set up an observatory for that process. Indeed, the process moved forward quite quickly because when the G20 nations met in June this past year in Osaka, just a month after the OECD had announced the principles, the G20 nations effectively endorsed the OECD AI principles as a AI policy approach that they would seek to follow um, as well. I should mention, by the way, a lot of the slides I'm, I'm putting up here today, the, the 
primary source materials are available on the EPIC site or at our bookstore. I'll also post uh, uh, for two on and others uh, the, the slides so you can get access to them. But the text of the G20 declaration I think is remarkable and you'll see a real desire to engage uh, the, the policy challenges of AI. Uh, we recognize that AI, like other emerging technologies, may present challenges, including to labor markets, privacy, security, and ethical issues, to foster public trust and confidence. We are committed to the human-centered uh, approach to AI, and this uh, references the OECD uh, policy uh, framework, as well as ongoing concerns about privacy. So in one respect, I think this is now an international uh, baseline for AI uh, policy uh, frameworks. When we talk about uh, subsequent developments in national law or international agreement, the starting point will likely be uh, the framework that the OECD has announced, that the G20 has endorsed, uh, as a reference to try to understand what more needs to be done either in the articulation of policy goals or in the implementation uh, of these policy goals that have been announced. But on the one hand, while I should be uh, cheering the outcome, I will tell you frankly that we also felt that the OECD uh, principles are incomplete. And so while we were working with the OECD in support of this policy framework, we were simultaneously developing a human rights-based framework for AI, which came to be known as the Universal uh, Guidelines for AI. We have this nice uh, photo featuring Tuan uh, from our conference in uh, Brussels a little bit more than a year ago. He's seated on a panel, by the way, I should mention, uh, Helen Dixon, who's to my left, is the Chief Privacy Commissioner for Ireland. Uh, to Tuan's left is Elizabeth Denham, who is the Chief Privacy Commissioner for the UK, um, probably the most influential uh, privacy official right now in the world. It's actually her office that was responsible for the Cambridge Analytic investigation. So we've conducted this policy dialogue on the human rights front at a high level, engaging public officials and technical experts and seeking to promote uh, frankly, a broader understanding of the requirements we believe that need to be adopted to safeguard human rights in the AI era. You can find uh, the guidelines at uh, the Public Voice website. Uh, that's the preamble. And you'll see quite a bit more detail uh, than what the OECD had announced. One of the issues that we actually wrestled with was the notion of the scoring of individuals. And we ask the question, do you uh, regulate uh, scoring? Do you prohibit scoring? I mean, we have in the United States many firms that score people on a wide range of activities. Grading is a form of, of scoring, of course. So a prohibition on scoring would seem an odd thing to do. Nonetheless, there was a strong sense in the group that put together this framework that a single score issued by a government regarding its citizens was a form of stigma, almost like a soft criminal sentence. And so we actually announced in this framework a prohibition on what we call unitary scoring. We have just decided that the social scoring system of China has crossed the line and should be opposed and we believe democratic governments should rally in support of that proposition. We've also put forward what we call the termination obligation. It's a bit of a movie reference, but it's also a recognition that if you deploy an AI system, you are ultimately responsible for the consequences of that system uh, that you choose uh, to deploy. And we have a real concern that in the development of autonomous and semi-autonomous systems, there will be a tendency uh, for governments and for organizations to cede authority and to cede uh, control. And we want to make very clear at this moment in time that you will always remain responsible for systems that you put in place. In fact, 
the degree of responsibility increases as the complexity and the opacity of the system increases. The work becomes more difficult, but that actually underscores the responsibility to be prepared to act. And as I said, these 12 principles set out in the Universal Guidelines for AI are intended as a more comprehensive approach to the challenges that AI systems present than what the OECD and the G20 countries have so far managed. Now, one of the practical challenges in this field, as I'm sure uh, you all are aware, is that there is a, you know, there must be a software or app out there titled AI Ethics Policy Framework Maker, because the number of AI ethics and policy frameworks is just growing, you know, daily. Uh, every organization, institution, government is wrestling with this issue and going through what I think is an important exercise to try to understand what their principles or approach will be. We decided last year to publish what I believe was the first um, reference book containing the significant AI policy uh, frameworks that we had identified. I have the, the 1999 edition over there and the 2020 uh, edition just came out this past week. But you'll see in this book uh, the international frameworks that the OECD and the Council of Europe have introduced. You'll see the national frameworks including the President's executive order on AI strategy. You'll see the frameworks from the professional societies such as the ACM, and the IEEE and others, as well as our own uh, human rights frameworks, the Universal Guidelines uh, for AI. And our aim is to try to create a context in which it's possible to have a conversation about what policy frameworks uh, should look like because I would say at this moment in time, it's actually very difficult to do that type of comparative analysis that makes possible a meaningful evaluation. And of course, there are now meta-studies of AI policy frameworks. I know the Berkman Center has done one. They identified 183. A friend of mine in Australia, Roger Clark, has done one. Uh, he's identified 60 different themes in AI policy frameworks. We put both the Berkman study and Roger study in our source book, making our source book a meta, meta study of AI policy. But we hope that will be useful to you. And you may be wondering, well, what are some of the current themes? I mean, if you think about AI policy, there's a lot out there. As I said, Roger's study proposed 60 different unique criteria. I'm just highlighting a few. One is that there's clearly a spectrum between law, which will have binding force on actors, and ethics, which tend to be aspirational. At one end, we have standards, and at the other end, we have principles. Human-centric comes up in many of these AI policy uh, frameworks. In fact, I think I would credit the Japanese government, which in 2016 produced one of the first uh, policy proposals for AI at the G7 meeting. And human-centric was an important theme at that G7 meeting in 2016. It's been carried forward in many of the frameworks since. Of course, governments are looking for growth, uh, not only job growth, but you see frequent references to sustainable growth and, and innovation. Uh, human rights concerns are sometimes summarized as fairness, accountability, and transparency. And then, of course, the OECD highlights democratic governance, rule of law, and fundamental rights. In the introduction, both to the 1999 version and the 2020 version, I provided a brief uh, narrative commentary to try to explain some of the key uh, tensions we also identified. And one is clearly uh, a growing, I don't know if this is a bifurcation, but between a democratic governance concept of AI and an authoritarian concept of AI. And the simple way I would say to understand this is that there's a lot of enthusiasm in, in the West uh, among democratic for societies for so-called smart cities. Uh, the Chinese government is very interested also in the deployment 
of digital techniques in modern urban settings, but they don't use the phrase uh, smart cities in the various belt and road uh, proposals. They talk about secure cities, which have a somewhat different aim uh, than might smart cities. All right, I'm gonna say, we've got a bit more to cover. Uh, we've been doing a lot of interesting work. Uh, we're very interested in the development of AI policy that the public uh, has the opportunity to meaningfully participate because we are concerned about a relationship between government and the private sector that tends to exclude the public from meaningful uh, decision making. And for that reason, beginning in 2018, we have launched a campaign with scientific societies, including the AAAS and ACM and IEEE, to ensure that the US policy process would incorporate public opinion. And we were making uh, progress particularly with the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy, which had an open uh, public comment process. But then we ran into some difficulty um, with a new entity that was created uh, by the National Defense Authorization Act of 2018 called the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Are people here familiar with this uh, commission? Yes, no? Oh, well that's few Sandy is, and you are, okay, good. Well, this is an important entity, uh, and it is specifically tasked with making recommendations for the President and Congress regarding AI policy. And our view is that it was necessary for this entity to reach out to the public and to observe open records laws and open meeting laws, as would other federal commissions. And by the way, the approach that has been taken in other countries, including Canada, France, Germany, Japan, has typically been inclusive of public opinion. The commission, not so much. Uh, they issued an interim report just a month ago uh, the co-chairs, Eric uh, Schmidt and Robert Wark, I'm, I'm sure some of you know, outlining the responsibilities of the commission to consider the methods and means necessary to advance the development of AI in the United States, but refused to be subject to open records laws. And you may be wondering, well, what exactly are you concerned about? They have all these experts, they're 15 different people, they just had a public uh, meeting, what's, what's the worry here? Well, if you read the report carefully, which we did, uh, you find buried in some of the footnotes a very sharp uh, criticism of the European approach to privacy protection, which is known as the GDPR. You find a statement uh, that says that it may be necessary for the U.S. to gain access to personal data held in the federal government to be able to compete, for example, with China in medical research, which I would say is a very controversial uh, uh, proposition. And you also see a very select disclosure of the experts and consultants that the commission met with during the course of its 200 closed door meetings. So as we like to do in Washington, we sue people. Uh, we sued uh, the AI commission and uh, we won. <laughs> This is just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we got an opinion, thank you. Privacy group gets okay to seek federal AI panels uh, records. And it's uh, actually a very good 23 page opinion from a judge who writes at one point, uh, like a stranger offering candy to a child, the government invites this court to ignore what the law actually says. That's a judge with a sense of humor. It's a good thing he's on our side, and not the other side. So we're going to be getting the records of the um, AI uh, commission, and we're going to try to find out more why it is that this commission thinks that the government should get access to personal data held by the federal government. Um, it's also from our website. We followed almost immediately the, the court's decision uh, Oh, that's actually the rich. No, that's following the court's decision. But these are the controversial issues that we've identified in, in that report. A few more um, items for you just to be aware of. As I said, in Washington, we like to sue people. It's an alternative to exercise, I guess. And um, we brought a complaint to the Federal Trade Commission regarding a firm called HireView, uh, widely used, uh, I think, also by many universities to assess 
job applicants has a proprietary AI technique uh, that, among other things, uh, does an assessment of a person's facial image to decide whether or not they're qualified to obtain a job. And we raised concerns about that, but as a legal matter, we said this could well be an unfair and deceptive trade practice, and we asked the um, FTC to take a look at it. And a bit of innovative lawyering, we also said to the FTC that you need to consider the OECD AI principles as what are called established public policies, a form of soft law that we want the agency to now take account of as it assesses AI-based business uh, practices. It's kind of neat, actually. We sort of created the soft law, and then we go to the commission, the agency, and we say, now take account of that soft law. And if we succeed, then you have new law that safeguards um, individuals. And that particular case actually got a lot of attention. This is Forbes. Uh, writing about our efforts to learn more about the use of AI in employment screening. We're looking at AI and pretrial risk assessment. We have a series of open government requests to various correctional agencies at the state level that are producing scores for judges to tell the judge this person should get six months and this person should get two years. And the judge says, well, what is the basis of that determination? And the prosecutor says, well, that's a proprietary technique. We actually can't explain that to you. But trust us, it has high predictive value, so you should rely on it. Um, it turns out, if you do FOIA requests to the state correctional agencies that are reviewing these systems, internally, they are expressing concerns about the use of automated risk assessment techniques because the outcomes don't align with what they would anticipate would happen. And you only find that out if you go to the state level, which we've done in Nebraska and Idaho and elsewhere, to try to understand the consequences of AI. OK, I'm going to um, kind of wrap up here, but also tell you about the next campaign. And if we're successful, maybe have another good story to tell in a year or two. Um, it's become increasingly clear to us that the one area of, of rapid AI deployment that seems to raise the most fundamental human rights concerns is actually uh, face recognition. And we didn't come to that uh, conclusion uh, alone. I mean, this is a report from the New York Times this spring. My letter, which I actually was, was responding to the New York Times report in the spring, says, um, one month, 500,000 face scans, how China is using AI to profile a minority in a major ethical leap, for, interesting phrase, ethical leap. For the tech world, Chinese startups have built algorithms that the government uses to track members of a largely Muslim minority group. And um, the Chinese government has drawn wide, in, wide international condemnation for its harsh crackdown on ethnic Muslims in the uh, Western region, including holding as, as many as a million of them in detention camps. What is so troubling about this development is the role that technology is playing in extending control over a minority uh, population um, and the economic uh, push behind the firms that are developing these techniques is not incidental. This is Wired writing in September, one of China's highly valued facial recognition startups has filed for an IPO. Most of its revenue comes from a unit selling surveillance and security systems. And here you see a very nice representation of the social uh, scoring system in China. To be able to see someone in a public space, identify them, and then assign to them a rating as to essentially their loyalty to the government. Yes? Because that's really at its core what this score is. It's the loyalty to the government. That is a future that in some parts of the world is the present. And this is playing out 
somewhere else that we should be concerned about, and that's in Hong Kong. If you've been following the protest in Hong Kong, this is a protest that's actually taking place in two different centuries. It's taking place in the 20th century because you can see protesters on the street and you can see police containing protesters and sometimes you can see a physical attack. But it's also taking place in the 21st century because the streets are surrounded by surveillance cameras and facial recognition is being used to identify people in public spaces and protesters are covering their faces and cases are going to the Hong Kong court as they did recently to decide whether or not protesters have the right to wear those masks to conceal their identity over a British law that said that people may not conceal their identity in a public space. Good news, by the way, on that case, the Hong Kong court ruled that people do have the right to conceal their identity in public space. That is entirely a response to surveillance techniques that are now being used to crack down on protests in Hong Kong. Anyway, here I am. Uh, I was uh, speaking in uh, Tirana. Do you know what Tirana is? It's the capital of Albania. And I was in Albania for the annual meeting of the Data Protection Commissioners. And I was urging the Data Protection Commissioners to endorse a resolution in support of a moratorium on facial recognition. Because I believe that this is the number one uh, human rights concern today in the deployment of, of AI techniques. We've um, launched a campaign. Uh, there's a reference here actually to the Chinese uh, scoring system in the image because of course it's not simply identification in public spaces that's taking place, it's also an assessment that's taking place of the individual. And I guess when I close my talks, I always like to ask people to do something. So I'm going to close my talk today by saying if you are uh, concerned about this issue, uh, recognizing the full potential of AI for innovation and, and growth and, and research, which I think we all share, but nonetheless are prepared to take action when you see the use of AI that is not favorable to uh, human society, I would ask you to sign our declaration, which is available online. It's a calls for a moratorium on facial recognition technology for mass surveillance. We have so far about 500 experts around the world, more than 100 organizations in more than 40 countries, and uh, we will, on uh, this site, uh, be tracking developments and keeping you up to date. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, please take some of our materials. Mark, could I?